So you want to register to the Kubernetes 101 introduction to Kubernetes concept workshop on demand. If you don't want to do that now and you prefer to follow what we are doing on my shared screen, that's okay too. Uh, you can come back to that uh, workshop on demand anytime you want, 24 by seven. So it's, it's available for anyone. So once you registered, you probably got a mail, then two mails, and the second mails got you credentials uh, to access our Jupyter platform. And you should be at the same uh, exact same step as I am right now, which is in the so-called README um, Jupyter notebook. So uh, this is uh, our notebook, and we'll have, as you can see here, a number of these. They are basically one notebook per module. And uh, before I go into the first module, I'd like to uh, give a quick uh, introduction to what, how you manage or how you going to handle your Jupyter notebook environment. Maybe not all of you are familiar with that. So basically a notebook, like uh, it's, it's, a, it's a file and uh, actually it's written in JSON and it's uh, an IPINB, which stands for high, uh, Python uh, notebook. Uh, and uh, initially this whole environment was only written for, for Jupyter, uh, sorry, for, for Python. Uh, since then, uh, actually there are more than 60 kernel for running code uh, within Jupyter Notebook. So you, we, here we are going to use during this lab only Bash, but there are of course Python and, and many other languages that you can find like Ansible and like Go, like Java, all are available uh, through different uh, kernel as we call it. Here, I, you can see that Python is selected, but you can see a few of these that we have loaded in our environment. Um, then a notebook is made of something called cells, uh, one or more cell. In this particular case, you see the cell is highlighted in blue on the left on my screen. And there's only one cell here, or actually there are two empty cells, but, but there's one big cell and the cell can be either uh, um, what we call markdown, uh, and this is one, and it's basically a bunch of markdown that you will render when you run it, or it can be code. So we don't have any code in this particular notebook, but you will see that in the next notebook, whenever we want to execute something to show you something in action, we will use a bash script that will be written into a specific cell. So when you navigate down your notebook, you will see your cursor, that blue thing, go down with the cell and you will be executing no, uh, markdown cells, which is basically rendering it or executing um, uh, code cells. And in that case, then the output of the, the code is, is displayed right be, behind uh, the, the code cell. You can run the cell as, as many times as you'd like. Well, it might have an impact, so you have to be careful. If you want to play uh, a, a cell, you can use the little arrow at the top here, which I'm highlighting right now, or if you're like a keyboard guy, like I am, you can use control enter to uh, run or shift enter to run and move to the next cell, which is kind of the most um, used one. But in some cases, it's good to know that you can enter control enter that runs and stays on the same cell. So this is useful when we do, for example, we ask you to look at some um, uh, we'll do, we'll use uh, kubectl to look at some logs, for example, the status of some, of some pods or some, uh, or some services. And if you want to see the thing change because it's coming up online, for example, then you can run multiple times the command by using uh, control enter. Okay, so these are tricks. Um, I, and then when a cell runs, you will see there's a little uh, counter on the left of the cell that shows nothing when you haven't run it. It will show a star when you are currently running it and it will show a number once you run it, which this number is the number of execution that you run that cell. You cannot run another cell if one is already in action. So you need to use the stop button at the top and there will be one case in my, in the lab here where we need to stop the thing because somehow it doesn't return properly and then you can run the next cell. Another point that is not in the instructions here is you can download things. Uh, if you like that and you think you want to reuse that, you can download uh, the notebook itself, which means that you need a notebook of a Jupyter environment on your laptop or somewhere on the server to, to run those uh, workshops. 
uh, when you save it, uh, I think it's better to save it at the end of the lab when all the outputs are displayed, because then you get those saved with the notebook. It can be useful. You can also export as a PDF. Uh, and I think it's in the file menu uh, somewhere. Uh, I'll save as, uh, save notebook as, and you can get an option to save as PDF. There again, it's better to save with the output so you get a trace of what you did during the lab. All right, I think we've got enough instructions now. Let's move to the introduction by clicking on the, on the first uh, link here. And we move to a different uh, notebook here. And, uh, and this is basically to tell you and, um, that this lab actually was, uh, is an existing CNCF uh, tutorial that I ported to our Jupyter notebook environment. It was initially using another technology and we're using it with, uh, with a, uh, under our common uh, creative common license and you can uh, use it too. And we reuse the same graphics and everything. So you might ask yourself why you've seen those uh, somewhere else before. Now that I've told you that, I, how about uh, Nigel? What about uh, telling people like, what, what is Kubernetes? Like, you know, like the, the high level pitch or what can it do for me uh, before we dive into the first lab? All right, mate, no worries. <laughs> I'm feeling the heat, the heat under the studio lights here. I'm about to take my jumper off. <laughs> um, it's interesting. Thanks, by the way, Didier. So we've just had all that conversation, Tom and I. And um, as you've asked me to introduce this, I've just realized we haven't really said what Kubernetes is yet. Yeah. Um, so for the benefit of those who maybe don't know, I think like the super high level, it's just software, right? Um, but it's software a little bit like an operating system, and I'll expand on this in a second, um, but that abstracts your infrastructure that your applications will actually run on, servers, virtual machines, cloud instances, things like that. Um, but as well as abstracting that kind of infrastructure layer, Kubernetes also provides a bunch of intelligence that we need for modern applications. So um, as like an infrastructure platform, excuse me, Kubernetes, um, as long as you have written your applications as containers and microservices, which I know we touched on a little bit, okay, there were some questions about that. Um, but as long as you write your applications as containerized microservices, then Kubernetes will bring to your applications um, fundamental things that you need in the business world today, like self-healing. Um, and I know that we're going to see a bunch of these things in the lab as we walk through, okay? I, I won't take too much time because I know... You <laughs> I'm guessing people want to get to that, but self-healing, Kubernetes will provide that. Um, the ability to scale, um, the ability to perform rolling updates and rollbacks, which again, I know we've got in the labs. Um, so all of that kind of stuff. So Kubernetes, it's software that we install on servers, virtual machines, cloud instances, um, and then we run our microservices applications on that Kubernetes software. And Kubernetes provides all of the advanced features and things that we want for modern applications. I don't really want to say too much more than that, Didier, because I know that we are going to look at some of those things in a little bit more detail. And um, so maybe if we, if I hand back to you, we crack on with the labs a bit um, and I will flesh things out, you know, as we get to look at de the deployments part yep. of the lab, we'll talk about that. Yeah, um, let's just do that. before you take it though, Didier, just keep those questions coming while Didier is talking, while you're doing the labs. I'm around to answer questions. We've got other people in the background as well. So keep the questions coming, yeah? Yeah. And before we go to the first lab, let me bring up a little poll because we told you what Kubernetes is, but we'd like to know what's your level of knowledge right now. And uh, we have a quick poll that we'd like to, to actually run. So you can tell us what you do. And uh, in the sequ second question, what... What's your level of expertise with Kubernetes right now? We know this is a one-on-one -on -one talk, so, um, but uh, we might have somebody that practically invented it. And uh, we'd like to know also um, what is your, uh, what, what best describe your, uh, your work with Kubernetes? We just leave that for just a second. Uh, while I'll explain that we have six modules in this lab, and uh, the first module is really about exploring our cluster. We will not be creating a cluster. It's already created for you, but we just look at uh, you know, the nodes and some of the command that we'll be using. And then it's really all about uh, really the, the, key, uh, the key function of, of Kubernetes, which is to 
basically deploy and manage application at scale. And uh, so we'll do that with a very basic application that is a small Docker container application. Uh, and we will use that to, and we'll deploy it in module two. We'll explore some of the concept of deployment in module three. Then we have to, there's a lot of networking around Kubernetes, you know, it's, it's pretty secure uh, by design. So you need to expose only things that you need uh, once it's available uh, before people can get to it. So we'll, we'll talk about that in module four. And then we'll talk about, and this is a great feature of, of uh, Kubernetes as well, which is scaling. And uh, you'll, we'll show you how you scale basically in a rolling upgrade mode, uh, an app, our application to multiple uh, pods and nodes. And finally, we'll, we'll do an a rolling upgrade of the application to a newer version, which is also a very uh, popular use case uh, where uh, Kubernetes actually shine. So let's, um, I guess you got a chance to answer the, the poll. I, I'm going to uh, close it now and, and share the result just so everyone sees um, uh, what we have here. But uh, we have a mix of people that's kind of, Okay, so we have people that are not sure how to pronounce it. So I'm not sure I pronounce it right, but we say Kubernetes. Um, and then uh, they are not using it, but they have plans to use it. So that's, I think that's perfect. Uh, so let's continue with that, uh, with that first lab. I don't know how many of you have selected to run the labs. I, I can't see that right now. Actually, I can take a look. We have a quite nice monitor here to take a look at our infrastructure. So we see that right now we have uh, about 19 people that are running uh, an environment. So that's, that's cool. Um, so let's move on to uh, module one. Uh, maybe uh, before we move on to the lab itself, let's, let's as I said, this, this cluster is already built uh, for us and it's actually managed and, and we'll show you that very briefly at, in one of the lab, it's managed by Esmeral Container Platform but uh, uh, do you want to, uh, Nigel, say a few words about you know, what makes a cluster, uh, what's a master, and what type of nodes you have in a cluster? Sure, yeah. So I think I was going to mention it a little bit later on as well, but that's fine. So I talked about Kubernetes being software that we install on servers or VMs or cloud instances or whatever. And um, when you do that, you're building a cluster, um, which... I, it, at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of machines that all work together, okay? Now, a Kubernetes cluster is comprised primarily, well, it's comprised of two different types of nodes, control plane nodes that we sometimes call masters, and then worker nodes. So the control plane nodes are where, like, the intelligence of Kubernetes resides, um, things that will enable your applications to self-heal and scale and rolling updates and stuff. All of that intelligence exists on the control plane. Um, then the worker nodes are where you run your business applications. Um, and of course, you need to make sure that the, well, the control plane nodes and the worker nodes really um, have to be specced so that they can cope with the demands of your applications and things like that. And um, we may come to it a little bit more in some of the later labs today, but I think probably for now that that's enough. So you install Kubernetes on a bunch of machines. They form into a cluster of machines that work together. They can be VMs, cloud instances, uh, physical servers in your on-premises data center if you need them to be, um, and they're where you run your applications. And of course, the important bit is Kubernetes provides that intelligence of the self-healing and scaling and, and all of that jazz, yeah? Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah, I was going to say they can run on VMs, they can run on physical nodes, they can run in yeah. the cloud, they can run on premises. It's, as, as, as Nigel said, it's software. And uh, in our particular case, it runs on physical hardware. And, um, but it, frankly, doesn't make any difference here. So let's go and uh, do the first lab, which we won't create the cluster, but we'll explore our cluster. Before we can get access to, um, to the cluster, we need to actually log in and identify. We'll use the student ID that you've been assigned. So you need to first run that cell. So this is the first thing that we'll run. You can see on the upper right corner, it's a bash, it's bash commands. So let's just run uh, together this first command. So for the 19 people with an environment, you need to run uh, the, the command with the arrow or uh, with uh, sh shift enter. Okay, we get a feedback as an output here because it, you see the echo here, and then we run to run the second command. Uh, so that's another shift enter for those who run uh, with the keyboard. 
Now we uh, got an environment uh, which basically tell us what is our username, uh, what is our user and what is our tenant. There's a multi-tenant environment uh, taken, uh, managed by, uh, by um, Esmeral in this environment. So we need to, to set exactly what we are. And we get a bunch of uh, endpoints here, which are not so important for the, for the rest right now, but let's move on. The second thing is, and maybe you want to say something about that, Nigel, is uh, say a few words about Kube, Kube Cuttle or Kube CTL and what it is and why uh, people go crazy about this tool. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, pronounce it however you want. And to be honest, Didier, pronounce Kubernetes however you want as well. I really feel like, before I answer your question, that the, um, the, the community and the ecosystem is a really friendly one. So although containers and Kubernetes might feel like they're daunting um, subjects or daunting technologies for you as an individual or for your organization or whatever, and the community is really welcoming. So feel free to pronounce these things however you want. Nobody's going to get upset at you. But kubectl, that's how I pronounce it, um, is the main Kubernetes command line tool. So we're going to be using it here in the labs to um, deploy and manage applications. Um, it's a separate um, program that you would install probably on your laptop, and then you use that to manage your apps um, and kind of almost as well, um, sometimes manage your Kubernetes clusters as well. There are other command line tools that let you do more cluster management, but yeah, kubectl or kubectl or kubectl, whatever you want to call it, um, basically the Kubernetes command line utility. All right, so exactly what we need for the rest of this, this lab, because everything we will do in the next uh, uh, 40 minutes is to use that uh, kubectl or kubectl. Just about the naming, I will add that if you read uh, documentation, sometimes you see uh, Kubernetes abbreviated K8S. So don't, don't be surprised, it's, it's still Kubernetes, but uh, it's just abbreviated. So let's run that, uh, that cell that will download basically um, kubectl from uh, the Esmeral platform, which, which manages this cluster. So we have a kubectl file now. Um, we can uh, move on and run our first uh, kubectl command, which I, as Nigel said, you would probably have on your laptop if you're doing a lot of Kubernetes uh, stuff. And uh, the first thing we wanna do is run, uh, for example, we are not going to go through all of the kubectl command. There, there, there are lots of them. Uh, we just explore a few and give you enough uh, insight so that you got <laughs> you want to continue on your own. But cluster info will probably will get you the state of some of the component important con component of of your cluster. We don't really have time to go and and talk about each of these in details. So I'll move on. But you can explore that. Uh, another one that you probably would run quite a lot is what is the status of this particular cluster that I'm using in my day-to-day -day work. And uh, here we see that we have a cluster and this cluster is assigned to me as a, as a user. And this has four nodes. One is a master node, it shows here. And the other three are worker nodes. And we can see the version of Kubernetes that is actually running right now. And we see the full name, uh, the full DNS name of that machine and its status. So everything looks good here. We all operate from that same cluster, by the way, um, and uh, for the rest of the lab. We can also do more details and um, uh, look at the config uh, of the cluster. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about this, but you can get complete information about your cluster from there. And uh, remember uh, in Kubernetes, a lot of stuff um, are, are done with YAML. And you will see that uh, we get a lot of file input or output from uh, in, in YAML. So you, I'm afraid you have to get used to that. <laughs> Um, so that's, that, that's it for having a cluster to work with for the rest of the lab. So let's move on to uh, lab two. Um, and let me just close that. Uh, so lab two is uh, about deployment. So maybe before we dive into the lab, uh, Nigel, do you want, you want to explain quickly what a, what a deployment is in, in, terminal, in Kubernetes terminology? Yeah, sure. So um, in Kubernetes, we use the term deployment with a capital D because um, it is, uh, without getting into the buzzwords too much, it is um, a feature of Kubernetes. So uh, deployments are the way that you, this, this is brilliant, right? Deployments are the way that you deploy stateless applications to Kubernetes, but it is, right? So let's say you've, um, we'll be dead simple, right? You're running a web server 
and it's fronting requests to um, a catalog that you've got on the back end, people buying stuff or something. And you know that for the most part, you need five instances of that web server running. Um, instead of you manually deploying five containers or five pods, we'll, we'll take a, a closer look at that a little bit later, um, or, or let's just call it five instances of your web server. What you do is you write a bunch of YAML, and don't be afraid of YAML, okay? It's a little bit daunting at first, but it doesn't take long to get your head around. You write some YAML um, as a Kubernetes deployment object um, that says, okay, I want to run this particular web server, and make sure, please, Kubernetes, I've always got five replicas running. You um, then send that YAML file to Kubernetes, to your cluster, the control plane. Remember where we said that intelligence is. Um, and Kubernetes will deploy five of those web servers for you. And then it will spin up in the background something called a deployment controller. It doesn't really matter the detail about that. Basically, Kubernetes will deploy your five containers or your five pods that are running your web server. And then they'll watch the cluster and make sure that you've always got your five. Um, and if there's a failure or something, look, we talked about self-healing before, right? Or, or at least I mentioned the concept. Um, if one of your worker nodes in your cluster goes down and it takes, I don't know, two of those web servers with it, well, you don't need to worry as an individual, okay? Because yes, you've gone down from your desired five down to three, but Kubernetes is constantly watching it. That deployment controller is watching the cluster and it's saying, hey, I should have five, but I've got three, okay? I need to do something to fix that. So Kubernetes will spin up two extra web servers um, as containers running in pods, and it will deploy them to um, healthy nodes or healthy worker nodes in your Kubernetes cluster. So just think of a deployment as a way of um, coding the intelligence of what your application should be that in the simple example, right? Um, five instances of that web server, giving it to Kubernetes and letting Kubernetes just monitor it and do the hard work for you. So that once you've got it running, you go have a coffee, you can crack on with the rest of your life, go do some more work in the knowledge that Kubernetes has the intelligence there to keep that running. Um, and then you can come back to that deployment later if you want to, we're gonna see this, right? I'm getting a bit ahead of us. Um, and say, actually, right now we need 10 instead. So you just say, Kubernetes, change it to 10, please. Kubernetes goes and does the hard work, balances it across the worker nodes in your cluster, all of that jazz. Yep, we'll do that in module five and module six, but we'll start short, we'll start small and have a, a deployment with, uh, with a, a, a single uh, instance. Uh, we will use a, a Docker image that is pretty simple. It's just a website that responds with uh, kind of a, a simple sentence when you when you uh, connect to it. Uh, but before uh, we move on here, uh, you need to kind of get back your student ID in this new notebook. So we're going to have to run this command or this kind of cell every time we change notebook. So please run that first. And once you get back to, uh, okay, your, your cluster, we know we've got four nodes, but we can move on to that. So let's create our first deployment here. And you notice that we are talking about here an image. And we talked about that earlier. Uh, we use uh, Docker containers in that particular thing. And uh, we use a, a Docker image called Kubernetes Bootcamp. And we use its V1 version. It's more than one available on the, on the, on the Docker Hub. Uh, you can use that uh, on your own if you want. It's a, it's a public available, publicly available uh, Docker image. So let's run that. Uh, okay, deployment was created. That was that was very quick, of course, uh, because the image is small and uh, probably the image, the Docker container is also cached on this particular uh, host. But let's move Did on now. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Can I just jump in just real sure. quick, just to bring that into the context of what I was trying to explain before. So we haven't done it with the YAML file here. We're just doing it on the command line. Yes. Same, same difference, really. We're basically saying to Kubernetes here, create me a deployment that is one this is gonna be a web server, right? So like I said, it might be five web servers because we haven't specified the replica count. And I know we've got it in the notes here that you can specify the number of replicas. Basically we're saying to Kubernetes, deploy me one instance of the web server that's defined inside of the Kubernetes bootcamp v1 image. And the important thing is that Kubernetes keeps those instructions that we've given it as like our record of intent or our desired state. 
so that if our nodes did fail or the, the pod itself failed in the future, Kubernetes would know I need one, maybe it's gone down to zero, and it would bring it back up to fix it. So that simple command there is actually telling Kubernetes quite a lot. Um, I hope you don't mind that, Didier. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. Actually, it, it's right what you said about uh, YAML. In Kubernetes, there's always multiple ways to do things. You can do it with, uh, with a YAML file that gives the instructions of what you are creating, what you're doing, or you can do it from the command line. And you can move from one to the other in that sense that if I want, I can uh, get back as a YAML file the, the instructions that I, I use for, uh, for that command line here if I want to maybe to remember it for next time or something like that. So it's also possible. But here we use the command line, good point. So let's take a look at the deployments here. I, I, so this is just because we didn't want to mix up things between the different students, but uh, I realized that um, uh, you don't see the headers of the columns here. So it's maybe a little stupid, but by the way, this gives me an, an opportunity to tell you that you can change things in those cells, or you can cut and paste the cell using those two buttons here to try something else. Okay, if you wanna do something else that is a little bit uh, outside the lab, you can, Try other commands if you want. So let's get, try again with uh, without uh, the the grep. So we get the chance to see that we got uh, several users doing the lab at the same time, and we see finally what the heads of the columns are. I need uh, to find a better way to uh, to filter. Uh, basically, it tells you how many, uh, and I can tell that uh, student ten ninety one is <laughs> the head of me. Uh, that's great. Uh, that's fun. Um, we can see that how many. Um, Nodes are, oh, sorry, how many uh, pods in the deployments are, we haven't talked about pods, but bear with me, uh, are, are available out of how many I was requesting and we requested one, so, and one is available in most cases. Uh, but you see somebody here like 1091 is already requested four and four are available. So it gives you a chance to see uh, the number of nodes uh, compared to the desired state that Nigel was talking about. We also get a chance to see if it's up to date or not and if it's available and the, the, the dates since it was started. So let's move on a little bit here. Um, uh, we, oh yeah, okay, so we have that running. So what do we do with that now? Okay, we have that application, as we said, it's, a, it's, a, it's an, a web server. There are several ways we can show that it's running. The simplest one is to use the exec command. If you're familiar with Docker, it's very similar, it's basically, talking to the container without the pod, within the pod and, and running that command, which is basically uh, give me what's on localhost port 8080. That's the website that we have in this container. So if I run that, I can see that uh, the application is responding by hello, Kubernetes bootcamp, uh, get re be ready for that because we're gonna use that many times. And uh, it tells you which pod you're running on. So that's a pod number or pod name. And that's the version, it's a label that tells you which version of, of, the, of the container you're running right now. And we're gonna use that for the next lab when we do upgrades. So let's move on for now. Oops, sorry, I used the, the, the control instead of the shift, but uh, uh, we can move on. And the next thing is, if I wanted to ex uh, access my, uh, container from, uh, from somewhere else, because that's kind of useful. Uh, we can do that by uh, first approach without creating anything new. Uh, we can cut and paste that piece here, and you're gonna have to do that with me, with Control C. And then open, uh, as the instruction says, open a terminal window. And to do that, you want to go to um, the plus sign here that opens up this kind of uh, window here and you got terminal in there. So now I have a terminal and I can paste, oops, I can paste with the right button, which is control V. Okay, let me do that again. I want to copy this and paste it here. And what we are doing here, oh, wow, hold on. <laughs> it's kind of basic, but I am having trouble with cut and paste, which it seems crazy. I was just going to say, does right clicking work? No, because it does copy of the, the entire cell. Yeah. So let me just see control C, oh, control C and yeah. Okay, so what we do here is we retrieve our uh, student ID, some information that we need, and then we create with kubectl what's called a port forward. So meaning that 
anything that gets to that website, to, I will be or to that site, that host name, I will forward to my container. You wouldn't typically use that in a production environment, uh, but you will use what we will see in the next tab uh, when we expose the service. But this just give you a chance to to see the thing in action. So now, if I, it's like a tunnel that is open from localhost to the container. And if I run this now, uh, you will see that uh, I get the answer from from the container again. If you are not, if you didn't run that, you will get a, a, a timeout or something. Okay. So let let's move on to module three, and um, then we can talk about pods because we actually used the pod in the background here when we created our first deployment. We haven't really said what a pod is. Do you want to uh, take a take a crack at this, uh, Nigel? Yeah, I will. Yeah, I just want to tell people as well, before I get into pods, that that hideous long command set of commands that Didier just copied and pasted there, um, like when we get to talk about services in a minute, that there's ways that mean you'll never have to do stuff like that. Um, that's just for purposes of this lab. But look, yeah, a pod. So I think the best way to explain a pod is to start at the very beginning. So um, every, because pods run applications, right? But if we start at the beginning of an application when a developer is writing source code. So when you work with containers and Kubernetes, the developer's job in writing the code for your application doesn't change. So containers and Kubernetes will work with pretty much any language out there. Um, so you don't have to change your languages or anything like that. But the point is your developer or you as a developer writes an application in your source code. You take that application code and any dependencies like library files and things like that, and you build that combination into something called a container image. It's quite popular to use the Docker tool set to build this image. And um, once you've built that image, um, you would probably then store it on a container registry somewhere, just a centralized location. That means you can pull it down to your different environments that you have, okay? Um, but in order to run that container image on Kubernetes, you need to further wrap it in a construct called a pod. So basically, we've got three layers here. We've, we've got your application source code and its dependencies. Those are packaged up as a container, but to run that container in Kubernetes, we've got to add another layer that's called a pod. So a pod is just a lightweight wrapper that lets you run that containerized application on Kubernetes. Um, now the pod itself, provides for your application, well, it provides a shared execution environment. So within the pod, um, there's like a network namespace, and that just means like an IP address and a set of um, network ports and things and a routing table, that kind of stuff. There's um, shared memory within inside of a pod, and there are shared volumes within inside of a pod. So the potential exists for you to, if you need to, like if you've, let's say, got a web server, with um, another microservices application that's constantly pulling the latest content from somewhere and feeding it to that web server. If they need to be scheduled on the same node, the same work node or something like that, you can run those um, both of those containers in, or so the web server would be a container and, and the helper pulling in the, the content would be another container. You can run those two containers inside of a single pod. They can share memory and volume so they can pass data between each other. Um, I mean, we could go into advanced use cases like service meshes and things, put stuff like that in the questions if you want to, because I don't want to rob time here. But basically a pod, it's it's the smallest unit or the smallest executable unit on a Kubernetes cluster. So um, like I said, you take your application code, you package it as a container, and when you come to run it on Kubernetes, it just has to be wrapped in a lightweight pod. Um, and then actually, it, let me just hear real quick, Didier, um, we've talked about deployments before where we may have wanted five web servers. That would be five pods. So um, when we define the deployment, um, if we did it on the command line like we just saw there, we would say dash dash replicas five. And then Kubernetes is clever enough to deploy five copies of that particular pod across our cluster. Um, and then, of course, remember, um, Kubernetes and the deployment controller is clever enough to know that we always want five of a specific version. If that ever changes for whatever reason, Kubernetes can fix it. Or if we want to change it, we're going to see this in a minute, maybe we want a new version. We just tell Kubernetes, roll the version on every one of those pods for us, please. We sit back, Kubernetes does the hard work. Um, I hope that explains it. If you've got any particular questions still outstanding, while Didier is cracking on, just put them in the Q&A widget. 
um, and either myself or one of the SMEs that we've got on will try and answer. Thanks, thanks, Nigel. So I'll, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit on this too. So we get again our environment set up here for this notebook, which we just opened. Uh, we can see that we have our uh, student uh, 1082, that's me, uh, currently running. Uh, we're going to move quickly here because we've seen, uh, okay, we, there is an important, I give a few commands here, which apply to more than one object that you will see in many places during uh, the training here. Uh, kubectl get, describe, logs, and exec. Describe is one probably that is important if you want to know more about something. Uh, so here we're doing, for example, describe on a pod, but you can do describe on any, anything. Um, and describe pods will give you all the details about uh, the pod. And for example, uh, one other thing that you get from there is, you know, what node it's running on, uh, or you can get, uh, you know, the what namespace or that's the tenant name, what status. Is yep. Can you can you just highlight the labels up towards the top there? Because we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, we will. You get some labels. Yeah, exactly right. Here we got two, uh, which will be important in Lab 5. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what else? I don't want to go into too much details about this, but an important thing that you get from the scribe of a pod is the events that happen to this pod since its birth, basically. So here we see that it's pulled the image from Docker uh, successfully, uh, and it created uh, the container and uh, assigned it or the pod and assigned it to uh, a particular worker node. So if something goes wrong, this is the command that you want to run to find out what went wrong. And because, you know, as Nigel said, you can sit back and wait for things to happen, but sometimes things don't happen exactly like you wanted. And the describe will give you a lot of information. Um, so let's move on to, um, well, we use that describe, sorry. Uh, then we can go here. I'm, I'm going to step, skip, skip this step here because it's just another way to call uh, the, the container. It's just in a more complicated way where we talk about uh, the API that is uh, proxied by, uh, by, the, by the node uh, that hosts the container, the, the, the pod. So let's just ignore that. We basically are able to call uh, the application again, but just bear with me for, for that one. Um, Another way to get uh, information about uh, your uh, is to use logs, uh, given a pod name, for example, and you'll get uh, a, this will give you the output of uh, your. Uh, oops, there was a glitch in my video for some reason. The, uh, this gives you the um, the log, the output of your uh, of your basically of your application. So this gives you a chance to troubleshoot again if something went wrong. We used exec before to uh, to call the application, but you can use exec to find out, uh, you know, what's the environment of my. Uh, it's it's very it's very much like a Docker container. Find out what's uh, what's the environment variable when uh, on the container, uh, or find out if you're running the latest version of the uh, the website that you think you're running, and uh, to find out that you're not. Uh, Did he? Sure. Don't go on yet. I just want to bring it back to something before you're ready to move to the next lab. Well, yes, please do. Can we just scroll back up to the kubectl describe pods output? I just yes. want to see if there's something there. Ah, right. Yeah. Um, okay, so kind of in the middle, I don't know if you can identify, it lists the containers that are running. Yep. Um, so all the way down to the conditions, if you could highlight kind of that block, it's probably about 10 lines. So from, yeah, from, well, no, from conditions up to containers. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Basically, um, just to recap, because I know this is quite a lot if you're really new to this. Um, we've got a pod running. We've seen that with the kubectl get pods before. We saw one of one, and um, some people had deployed, or some one student at least had deployed four of four. Um, but those of you who have one pod running, that one pod is running this particular container here, and inside of that container, is a web server that we've seen the output before. I think it was hello pod or whatever. And um, so I just think it, it's it's important to conceptualize. We're describing the pod here. And then within that pod, there's one container. And within that container is the code and the dependencies for the web server application. I know we don't have a lot of time, Didier. I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Yeah, no, that, that's important. That's, that's really key because as you said earlier, you couldn't be running more than one container. It's not the case here, but you could. All right, so let's move on to, uh, oh, before we move on, I'm asking you to 
stop the terminal stuff here. So if you want to run a control C here, that'd be great. So we don't have any side effect of that when we expose the, uh, the application. So um, you want to say something about the, the, the services or the concept of services? Yeah, I'll be super quick. So I think when we've talked about pods and, and especially in the context of that deployment controller, the intelligence to self-heal, to do rolling updates, to scale up and down. Um, obviously, when you're writing applications, the, the point of that application is for something else to consume it. So to connect to it and, and get something useful from it. Okay, we're running a simple web server, right? But the point of this is to be able to point a web browser or a curl session at that pod and get the text back. Now, if we've got failures going on in the environment and pods being replaced, um, if we're scaling up to meet demand and then scaling back down when demand is gone, um, if we're doing rolling updates, so when we do rolling updates, we actually replace the running pods with new pods. This basically means we've got pod churn or pods coming and going from the network all the time. And you can't write your clients or other parts of your application or you don't want to write them with the intelligence in to constantly be probing Kubernetes and saying, give me a list of available pods, please, Kubernetes, that are healthy and working so that I know I'm not connecting to one that I connected to five minutes ago, but it's been replaced because it's been updated or something. So in the, in the world of pods, as we scale and self-heal and do updates and rollbacks, there's loads of stuff going on. Um, Kubernetes provides an object called a service object that provides a stable network front to a bunch of these pods. So instead of connecting to individual pods, which might be here now, but not here in five minutes, you connect to the service and the service is intelligent enough to always know which pods are running and healthy. And that'll do. That, that's another yeah, it's good explanation. It's yet another abstraction layer basically to uh, isolate clients from, uh, from what happens in the, uh, in the niche to cover. So basically here we want to expose uh, the the application uh, publicly so people can, or, or clients can, can connect to it. So let's connect back to uh, the, our environments. Uh, and um, if you run get services now, because we haven't got any service under my student ID, you get that error here, that's expected. So let's move on and, and say, okay, kubectl, I want to expose my, um, my uh, pod here. And uh, I will use a, a strategy. We won't talk about the other ones, but called NodePort. And uh, let's do that. And if we run again the get service, you will see that we now have a service running. Uh, we have an IP address. Um, and I can describe the same way I described the pod, I can describe the service. We get a little less information, uh, but we get what we need. Uh, you know, what is the, what is the, the type of uh, um, service? What is the IP uh, type here? and so on. So we get all the details we need. I'm sorry, I forgot to move, let me do that. Uh, then uh, we're going to um, find out uh, by doing a little bit of <laughs> uh, calculation here, what actually what node name actually host the pod right now, because remember it could run and Kubernetes decide that for you on any of the nodes. And we're going to connect to to that, uh, to that node over the port uh, that we have uh, as, been assigned. So you see now we get uh, this to work. It could work with any client. And by the way, we looked at one particular node, but there's a, an intelligence in Kubernetes to provide that same connectivity from any nodes. So you don't really need to talk to one node. You can talk to the cluster. So that's also handled. Uh, do you want to say a few words about labels? We, we showed labels and we, we are about to, uh, to, uh, to use here uh, a couple of labels. Do you want to just- Yeah, yeah. Something? Sorry, Didier. So I was just, I'm typing an answer to a command in the Q&A. Just scroll back up real quick. Do we have a, um, an output for a described service? We do. Okay, there we go. Right. So I think we pointed out earlier on that the, um, the pod that we did the describe on, well, it had two labels. One of them was system generated. One of them was a label that we applied to it. And those labels make it so that, um, well, actually, if we look at the, so the pod had labels, right? Then the, um, the service that we're looking at here has a selector. That's a label selector, okay? So it's looking for, um, not that one 
um, Didier, two rows down. Yep, 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 so the, what, what we've done there, it's okay. So the service itself has a label so that we can potentially, in a management UI or something, group all of the different objects for this particular application. But here, what, what makes this service, this stable network endpoint, send um, network traffic to the correct pods, it's looking for all pods on the cluster that match its selector here. So any pod on the cluster that has app equals Kubernetes bootcamp and then Didier student ID, traffic hitting this service endpoint will go to any pod that has that label. So later on, if we scale it up, we'll add, I don't know, five, content, uh, five pods, they'll all get that label and the service will round robin um, network traffic across all five of those pods. Um, and it, it allows it allows real flexibility so that um, if we scale up or we scale down, Kubernetes is just looking constantly on the network, on the cluster for all pods with that label. And as long as a pod has that label, it's going to get traffic from the service. And they're, they're super simple labels and label selectors, but I cannot tell you how powerful they are. And yeah. I was going to say it's a, it's a very simple concept, but it's, it's used widely and uh, intensively by by Kubernetes. So here, what we do is we, we run this uh, describe uh, command here, which uh, you can see labels have been assigned here. And then we uh, go and uh, we use, so whenever in a Kubernetes command, you want to use a label or you want to filter or flag by a label, it, there's in most cases, it's minus L for label. And uh, so we can say get pods, but only with the one labeled this, uh, or get the service with only the, this label. Uh, and you can label things manually if you want. For example, here we are adding a new label called version e e equal V1 uh, in that pod. Um, so that, remember labels, very important. Um, and you will see that, uh, that label here. Uh, here. Okay, so I'm moving moving quick here uh, because we need more stuff to uh, finish the lab. Uh, yeah, well, we can then use that for management basically. So you can filter things uh, on, on labels instead of um, finding out by uh, pod ID or things like that. So let's move on to the scale up, scale up uh, lab. Um, so as we you remember, we have only started with uh, one uh, pod right now. Um, and uh, what we're going to do now is uh, maybe you want to introduce the notion of replica set. We haven't really talked about that much. Sure. Okay. So a replica set is just a behind the scenes object that a deployment, which we've talked a lot about, uses to manage the number of replicas of a particular pod that are deployed. Um, so we won't directly interact with the replica set, but by direct interacting with the deployment, which we'll do by saying scale up the number of pods, the deployment object actually calls something else in the background called a replica set that does the hard work for it. Now we're gonna do this in a second. We've got people with multiple already. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just wanna point out that what we're showing here is, is the basics, right? We're, we're gonna manually do it. Kubernetes has a bunch of auto scalers as well, which you can program to say based on um, resource usage and, and things like that, that will scale up and down the number of pods that you have. I mean, Kubernetes even has auto scalers that will scale not just pods, but also the nodes. So like the virtual machines or, or the cloud instances that the pods actually run on. So we'll do it pretty simple here, but there is auto scaling technology available to you via um, Kubernetes as well. Good point. Um, here, we're gonna do it manually. We're gonna say, okay, from one, which we have currently, we're gonna do four uh, by using the minus minus replicas equal four. So you wanna run that command. Uh, it's scaled, so we can take a look at the, the deployment now. We see that we've got two out of four because it's currently building it, uh, and now four out of four. So now we've got uh, the desired state and current state are the same. And you can take a look here and see that the pods are all running. And if you notice here, they're all running on, on most are running. On, we have three nodes and four pods, so they're running on different nodes. So Kubernetes is, is, is dis dispatching them on different nodes. Uh, automatically. Uh, and uh, we can look at uh, describe again and we get the information about what is the desired state, uh, what is the total, what is available, um, what has been updated, uh, the strategy type, all of these parameters can be changed. We will not change that, but uh, you can. Um, 
that's I think enough details for now. So um, let's go back and uh, do a description of the service. Um, we use that node port stuff. Um, and let's see, has the value of the node port assigned? Yes, node port was assigned. Where is the node port? Right here. Um, so basically what we can do is- uh, Didier, just real yeah. quick, just highlight sure. the endpoints line underneath node port, because that's the IP address net, IP addresses of the four pods that we now have running. Just wanted to point that out. Yep, yep. So yeah, behind uh, this node port, uh, there is four uh, uh, node uh, pods ID, uh, IP that are capable of handling that workload. Uh, and we will see that in just a second because I think if I go to this cell and if you use uh, shift, uh, control, sh control enter on this one, you will see that the um, look, take a look at this ID here. This is the, actually this is the pod ID, but if you control enter and run the thing multiple times, you see that it's switching between the different uh, pods uh, running on different nodes. And we're hitting a different one every for every request of the curl command. So that's the ID. Uh, I, I will skip that because we're running out of time. But it was just to show you that a little bit of what Esmeralda Container Platform can can do and and show some of the stats. But um, well, you can do that on your own. By the way, you have the platform for four hours, uh, even if the the lab finishes in in uh, in ten five minutes. Um, so. Here we're going to do a little bit of cleanup because we'll recreate it uh, later on. So if we go blaze through that, you can delete the service by doing delete. Um, and if you get it again, of course it's gone, but, um, and you can connect to the, because we basically unexposed the application can connect to it. But if you exec, the pods are still there. It's just uh, this layer that uh, Nigel was talking about this, uh, little uh, wrap up a uh, wrapper around uh, the pods that doesn't exist anymore. So let's move quickly to the to the last module. And this is uh, about doing a rolling upgrade uh, and about uh, rolling back if something goes wrong. Um, you want to add something or we just go through the lab and you just- yeah, Just super quick. Um, Kubernetes ahead. has the intelligence built into the deployment controller that lets you do rolling updates on um, your applications. So it lets you control the pace at which you update them. It lets you insert um, like delays, like say we've got four pods at the moment. We might we might do one at a time or two at a time. It lets you wait in between. It lets you have health checks. Um, it provides the ability for rollbacks, really simple rollbacks as well. And that's all I want to say. Yeah, all, all of these parameters are, are, are editable. You can change that through uh, YAML. Uh, we kept it to the, to the, to the default for, for this lab. So let's uh, get our environment again. Uh, we see that we still have four pods right now. Uh, all of them are running. Um, okay, we know that. Uh, so what we want to do is, uh, okay, we've done that again. And what is important here is to remind you uh, of the, the version uh, of, uh, I thought we had the version somewhere here. I don't find it anymore. Uh, okay, no, we, we are at full design state and everything is okay. And the rolling upgrade strategy is set up. Um, and it's later on that I show you the version. So what we're doing here is we, we are updating, we are telling the deployment that the image is going is now going to be a different image, which is the Kubernetes Bootcamp V2, and uh, we told Kubernetes about that. And if we do um, a control enter here, we see that four of the pods. Probably I don't remember the IDs of my pods, but that's the four one that I, I had before. I've been terminating, and four new pods are now running. And this was done in a rolling upgrade way, so there was no. Uh, stop of service at any point in time. So if we uh, continue with that, oops, sorry, I did that already. Uh, now everything is running again, but if I do a describe, you will see that now uh, I need to find the version. I don't, oh, there we go. And the annotation is revision is two, but there was another one, I think, more obvious one. Uh, but we can see what happened also. We can see that it scaled down and up, the old one and the new one. So you get all the information that you need from, uh, from that stuff. Oh, there we go. I'm just blind. 
the image that I was looking for is now V2 of the application. Sorry about that. And um, if we expose that again, uh, like we did in the lab uh, three, I think, uh, and we call, uh, we scroll our, our command again, you will see that we are now V2. So we get the information about the application in its V2 uh, instance. All right, so let's, um, this is the command I talked about that, uh, okay, I should get rid of because it blocks my uh, kernel, but you see it stays with a little uh, star here uh, for some reason, I don't know why, because it tells me that everything was successful uh, for the rollout, uh, but I need to stop that manually for some reason. So bear with me for that. Uh, and we'll move on here. And we look at uh, the rollout. Oh, we can look at the details of the four ports. Um, we don't have, and we can see that all of them are running the newer version of the image. Okay. But let's take a look at when something goes wrong uh, because uh, Nigel talked about that uh, because this happens automatically. So let's see, I'm setting an image now to version 10 because I've been told that, you know, there's a, this new version coming up, version 10. I should have been suspicious because after two, there shouldn't be 10, but I do that. So I update the image with 10. And now we can like look at the deployment and we see we have only three out of four. So what's happening here? Uh, something is wrong. It's not the desired state that I expected. So if I take a look, you can see that there's a mess here because uh, uh, this pod was terminated because it took the first one to update to version 10. And then it tried to pull the image and it got to like, uh, oh, image error, this image doesn't exist. So it basically got an error trying to pull a version 10, which doesn't exist. So um, you can get more details about what went wrong uh, looking at the log. Uh, if you see here, fail to pull image V10, um, it basically not found. So that image doesn't exist, Some, something is wrong. So what happens now is you can say, I want to undo that deployment and it's been rolled back now. And if I look at the pods again, we are back in business with four nodes out of four. All right, and we can look at the details here. Uh, but that's more or less the same. They're all running uh, the, the, the version two and not the version 10. You want to add anything, Nigel, here? I, I was a bit quick, but... No, no, I, well, it's just on that. Um, I don't want to add anything technical. I just want to say, like, um, great job, by the way, Didier. Um, it's a lot to cover. And, you know, if you're watching or trying to follow along, it's a lot to take in. Just don't forget that um, the labs are available even when Didier and I are done here. Um, and, and do it in your own time um, and take the time to like have a real think about what's going on because there's there's some pretty cool stuff here and when you do it yourself I think it, if you can put aside like uh, maybe you've never seen kubectl as a command line tool before put that aside the tasks are really simple and you're doing some really powerful things so yeah that, that's really all I've got to say I think it was a good session thanks thanks Nigel yeah, so we can clean up here when we're done, but if you want to stay on and continue to work and re re take a look at some of the modules we've been very quickly uh, looking at, you can do that at your own time. We, as I said, the platform is available for four hours. So let me just jump to the conclusion because there's one thing I want to tell you. We, we have built a, a survey about those workshops. Please uh, fill up the survey and tell us what you thought about it. If you want to see more of these, uh, what you like and what you didn't like. So this is a couple of ways you can join the community I just talked about. You can start with our website, but we also have a Slack channel where you can ask questions about the different platforms that we, we have within HPE, whether it's compute storage, uh, Esmeral from, uh, or, or some of the open source projects like Speed Aspire. We operate a monthly newsletter. Um, we, we have uh, mail, of course, we have a, a Twitter and we have those uh, workshop on demand. So um, you can scan that code and this will get you to a page that has all those links so you don't have to pick any notes or anything. All right, with this, I would like to thank you again and um, hope this was good and useful for you guys. Thank you very much.